Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Knitted Art History where I am sitting telling you some art history stories while knitting so well um welcome to another video after a pretty long break as I got into my master's program like I was successful in that so I'm studying archaeology now and uh, well I mean <laughs> we had the whole semester and I think I really didn't have any time you know to research like additional topics to what I'm learning like in the university so yeah so that was that's why the break was so long but uh well i have like few weeks now of like holidays so holidays so i decided that i need to do like at least like you know a few videos in like in advance or whatever and uh yeah well as you can see by today's topic we're going to be talking about architecture uh specifically about our ukrainian castle and this is like one of the most famous, one of the most like, well, I don't know in terms of like, well, I mean, important also in terms of history, but well, it, it's one of the most like well-known com common, you know, castles that it, that comes to your mind when you're saying like to, to Ukrainians, I mean, when, when we're like, oh, what castles do we know? But um, by the state of this castle, like you will see, uh, you will never guess that it's one of the most important and one of the most famous castles in Ukraine because it's like it's in an awful state. So still, you know, barely any finances goes there. Like I, I don't know. Like I don't know what what again our government is thinking. But well, as as I'm constantly saying in the videos about Ukrainian art, like my country doesn't care about art. Our people does not care about art, so it's not just, you know, a problem of, um... <gasps> Yay! The light is on! <laughs> we had light off for a few hours now. Uh, so, um, yeah, what I was saying, like, you know, no one really is a, a part of those, like, people like me who are studying these topics, uh, or, like, painters and sculptures, like, whatever, just basically people of art in different shapes and forms, uh, no one really cares about this. Like, our country never made this campaign, you know, of explaining why art and culture is so important. And I, you know, <laughs> generally, like, shocked sometimes and uh, still surprised at, uh, at the moment how, you know, how our people need to be explained, why it's so important. And we are literally, I believe, like, we have this anti-record and we're literally the only country in the world where you need to beg your own people that like please let's save our language let's save our culture let's save our art like please 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 like especially you know still now we need to explain why we are being actively killed and tortured and raped and everything because like we are speaking certain language we are identifying certainly but still you know we have a lot of people like oh but what is like that's not so important, like, you're constantly, so, you know, so this is, like, a very huge problem still in our country, even, like, in this, in these realities that we have, and when we are, again, being literally destroyed, people are still, like, yeah, but that is not the mess, and that was not the real, literally, people say this, that this was one of the reasons, but, okay, I'm, I, I'm getting heated up on this topic very much, but, um, yeah, but this is like the problem and, and I mean like again you can see by the state of this castle what is going on and uh, yeah I mean it was damaged like I will tell you the story obviously so it was damaged it's not that it just got ruined like that on its own so it was a very big fire like uh, last century so like not so long ago but um, still you know in in a, in a countries that really respect their own again, culture and history, this castle would be already restored, but, well, thanks God that they made a roof there, <laughs> you know, we, we can say that it is, like, the good stuff, at least, but, uh, yeah, but this castle has a very rich history, and uh, on its own, very interesting and unique, and again, shows that uh, Ukraine was always in the context of Europe and European development uh, with, again, even in these questions of architecture, of uh, um, art, of uh, decorative arts, uh, of engineering, of fortification, like whatever, you will see like uh, these types of forms in a lot of European countries. So, yeah, 
uh, what I wanted to add. Oh, so I will also like add here some of my videos. So I was able like this year, we were able to get there with my mom. So uh, that was the first time actually that I visited this castle. So I have some footage from there. Uh, well, it will be mixed with some photos, obviously from like official sites and everything. So like not, not my direct photos as, as well as usual. I mean, I mean, I'm mentioning this in, 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 the, um, in the description. Uh, what else? What else? Oh, well, the other thing is also that I am trying, like, I will try that for the next video to do some little bit different format. Because, like, you know, I'm trying to, um, I will try to minimize my face in the videos because I literally can't. I do believe that my main problem was editing the videos and why I'm like, like, struggling. It's my face because I cannot, like, it's literal, literal torture to look at my face for a few hours straight while editing. So I will see maybe like maybe like that is the problem. So uh yeah, so uh today today what we will be showing you briefly how I knitted one of the presents for one of my friends for Christmas, uh which is coming. It's like in a few days and um yeah. Uh so while talking well I'll be telling you about art uh, well art, about castle, about this castle and uh, I hope that, well, this format will be also alright because again, like my face is not the most important part. It's, it's about art and it's about knitting, so we'll try to do it. And um, before we will start, maybe some of you will be interested while uh, like you will see what I'm knitting. So I will be knitting oh my God, so from this yarn. So can you see it? Like you kind of can see it. it's it's sparkling. It's such a beautiful yarn. Like I cannot describe you. I will I will show you the name and the number, obviously. So maybe some of you will be interested and you would like to make something similar from similar yarn. But uh, without further ado, my God, already I'm talking, talking, talking. Uh, without further ado, let's dive into our topic today. So today we're gonna be knitting a knitted bonnet. I I believe it's like called like this in English. So I bought this very beautiful um, yarn. So this one, maybe if some of you will be interested in that. So this is Alizelana Gold and what, where is the number? The number is this very beautiful, you know, this gray color. I don't know. And I will combine it with, um, with this. So also where is the number? Oh, the number is here. Maybe some of you will be interested. So I hope it will look good together, you know, like festive or something. So yeah, so I will start to knit this little bonnet with you. My stupid ass started to knit and knitted not the right thing, like a little bit different, you know, by like memory I started to knit a uh, different, bo not a bonnet, I don't even know what it's called, but well. Okay, let's start again. This time I hope correctly. So before we start, obviously I need to tell you, like I will briefly tell you the history of this place, who owned it and everything. So the castle itself was built in 1635-1640, so in a span of five years, on the side of the, like obviously, older fortification, which was mentioned as early as 1530s. And the castle was built under the guidance of uh, two famous architects back then, André de Lacroix and Guillaume de Beplan, at the request of the new uh, then owner of Broad and Pidhieti, those are two cities in the river region, Crown Hetman Stanislav Konecpolski, one of the richest men of the Polish political commonwealth. So the castle was, was essentially the well, resting place, as we can say, uh, like the summer house, as, as you wish, uh, of the crown hetman, because his main residence was uh, in the fortress uh, city of Brode. Uh, then, uh, in 1682, this castle became uh, a, well, a residence, like not official residence, but also a, like uh, summer summer place, uh, whatever, I don't know how to call it correctly in English, of the Polish king Jan III Sobieski. And this period is considered the golden period in the history of the castle, because Sobieski took care of Petirchino worse than the previous owner, Konecpolski. Later, in 1720s, uh, 
The castle was bought by another crown hetman, Stanislav Zhivutsky, this time. So the Zhivutsky family became the third owners of the castle, and Stanislav acti actively developed and rebuilt the castle. And as usual, as every castle in the world has its own ghost stories, so we have also... This castle is for the first, it was um, popularized uh, and... Uh, advertised uh, with this ghost story of uh, a white uh, lady so according to the le i will retell you the legend that this uh, castle itself so this castle is officially a museum now so this how this museum is retelling this uh, story because obviously there is uh, well at least like three four versions of how things were but briefly uh, this Stanislav Zhivutsky he had a young wife a very beautiful young wife and he was very jealous of her and in a fit of jealousy he buried his young wife alive in the walls of the dungeon and according to the legend when Stanislav was uh, leading his wife to her death she said so this is like my translation like I, I am not sure well, I mean, I hope you will catch the idea of what I mean. So uh, she said something like uh, like along the lines that how many there is steps down may the Zhivutsky family end in so many generations. And there were like only four steps, even though, as you can see, there is way more than four steps into the dungeon. But well, uh, we need four for this legend to work. And as always, by a coincidence of mystical circumstances, the Zhivutsky family indeed ended with Leon Zhivutsky, who was the fourth in a generation. And since then, for centuries, uh, villagers, workers, now tourists also, they have periodically seen and heard strange things. So there is like plenty of photos, uh, like photo evidences, we can say, of uh, this white lady roaming around the castle, uh, her standing in the windows, uh, on the balconies, you know, walking around the castle, like whatever. And uh, yeah, something like that. And they actually created such an interesting attraction there in, in the basement. So they put the speakers there with, you know, women whimpering and crying. And we, so we were walked around the castle and then we got into the dungeon uh with my mom and it, and it is so funny and so ridiculous because like i figured these things out immediately because you can hear this whimperings in uh, in the first floor just when you are coming to the castle yeah, through the main entrance you can hear this whimperings and i was like this is the speakers this like this is a cool idea and we got there but by the time that we got into the dungeon uh into this basement uh, uh, it was calm completely quiet we you know walked around a bit there read this story this legend and everything and then all of a sudden we're hearing the sound of a wooden door creak open you know we both with my mom like two cats <laughs> the hair stands out of, like you know on our head and our neck whatever and again i'm like i know that those are speakers but this is so ridiculous and like it was quiet then for like two three seconds and the women started to cry my god i don't remember when i ran so fast in, <laughs> in my life previously but we ran out of this dungeon so fast laughing though it was so funny and so cool so there was a, an amazing idea that the museum done but let's move on Later, the estate passed into the possession of Zhivutsky's son, Václav Zhivutsky, and it was during this period that the incredibly beautiful church of St. Joseph and the Accession, located opposite the palace, was built. After certain dramatic events, uh, we'll not get deep into that, uh, at the end of the 18th century, the castle becomes the property of Severin Zhivutsky, and he also bought at the auction uh, the villages around the castle. However, unlike his father and grandfather, Severin was uh, very fond of like treasure huntings, of alchemy and stuff like that, and thus was spending almost all of his time on it. And the fortress gradually lost its former splendor and grandeur. After Severin's death, the bastion passed to his wife Constanza Lubomoriska, and well, here I cannot really say you anything because she haven't done nothing like neither good nor bad stuff to the castle like changes or whatever in 1826 then another Václav from the Zhivutsky family became the owner of the castle this Václav also was a avid uh, an avid traveler loved adventures had regular trips so he was not very interested in the property as well as in its well-being 
and in 1831 Vaslav went missing actually. Don't know the history about that to be honest, but well it is what it is, and the Pidirti castle in an extremely neglected state became the property of one of his three sons, well this last Zhavutsky, Leon Zhavutsky. For more than 30 years Leon tried to give the fortress a second life, but his financial situation was quite bad. And then also in addition to his brothers, they died in hostilities. Leon himself never actually got married and thus never had children. And at the age of 57 he sold the Pidhirci castle to Vladislav Sangushko, with a special condition though, to look after and maintain the castle. Later, Vladislav handed over the castle to, uh, over the castle, I'm sorry, to his son Knesiev Stachy, and most of this period became a time for development and prosperity. So, just as Leon uh, Zhivutsky wished, a thorough restoration work was carried out. The castle was at the same time a home, a museum, a residence, and etc. etc. Numerous documentations, actually, and drawings and sketches, some bills, some photos, and other diverse sources testify to an active life in those years. And people were, uh, and it is said that this castle was open to representatives of various social groups also. So people were coming not just to meet uh, the family, the owners, they were coming to some celebrations, they were coming to do some researches in the libraries, you know, and just coming to just look inside, just walk around the castle and look at this amazing interiors that like I will show you at the end uh, of the story. So yeah, the life was going on. Knezyev Stachy and Gushko, he held various political positions in Poland, used the castle as his summer residence, uh, however his wife Constanza, she was the one who took care of the main restoration and museum works. After the death of his father, the work of support and development was continued by his son Roman, together with his, his mother. However, the Second World War put an end to the development of the Pidhirci castle, but thankfully the history of the castle did not end uh, there. And it is said that Roman Sangushko he then immigrated to Europe, then to Brazil, and again it is said that uh, his family is still actually alive there. Pidhirci castle is one of the best examples of a combination of an imposing palace and bastion fortifications in Europe overall. And you can see such an examples in actually a few of like other European countries. And it is located on one of the spurs of the Podolian upland. The southern part of the plateau in this place is flat and it is in its direction that the fortifications of the castle and the entrance gate are directed and the church also at like near this entrance gate and in the direction of the valley, uh, well, the main body of the palace itself, due to which uh, its windows and terraces and balconies, they open to a magically beautiful landscape and in good weather the area can be seen for dozens of kilometers. The castle has the shape of a square, as we can say, the size of which is approximately like 100 meters and 100 meters and there are pentagonal bastions on its corners. The castle is built of bricks and stones as usually and between the inner and outer walls of the castle there are casemates, so those are premises for warehouses and various services. The roof of the casemates, paved with smooth stone slabs, forms terraces surrounded by balustrades and these terraces were obviously used for walks and, in case of military need, for the placement of guns. So the tips of the bastions are crowned by elegant guard towers carved from sandstone, from the east, south and west and the castle is surrounded by a strip of defensive fortifications. In the 17th century the palace was two-story and on its sides and in the center there were three-story pavilions and a tower. In the first half of the 18th century then during the restoration works additional rooms were built between these pavilions and a tower, uh, external stairs and porticos were completed and the building was covered with a uniform roof from pavilion to pavilion and will basically turn into a three-story building as well you can see now. And the silhouette of the castle we can say like uh, lost its cheerful and jugged lightness, the building has become more massive, more calm and uh, the steep roofs of the side pavilions complete the crowns on which uh, there are copper figures. On the right stand we can see Atlas who holds the globe, this is like the world on his shoulders and on the left it's the same Atlas uh, but he holds the solar system, 
thus the universe. So in the 17th century it was possible to enter the castle through the raveling, the drawbridge and the main entrance gate. The ravelings and the bridge were liquidated as early as the 18th century as far as we know, but the entrance gate built of stone stones in the style of the late Renaissance was uh, perfectly preserved. In the right corner is a well with a depth of 38 meters, the internal uh, converging stairs which connect the courtyard with the side porticos and columns uh, which are called Italian loggias are of great importance to the palace. Uh, through these porticos you can actually go to the flat stone tiled roofs of the casemates and bastions which uh, form this balustrade terrace again that I showed you already and a good view on the defensive ditches and etc etc. Throughout the doors of these porticos you can uh, get into the rooms of uh, the well by castle architecture it counts as a first floor but technically it's the second floor and inside you could have seen the variety of impressive halls with the splendor of the ceiling decoration marble framing of the doors and fireplace glazed colored stoves wall paintings artistic parquets and a lot of works of art and weapons also all of that now is lost well except of marble framings of doors and fireplaces uh, if i am not mistaken but everything else is completely lost unfortunately and uh, so i mean but we have quite a bit of very good old photos where we can see all of this beauty which obviously i will show you in this video so the ceiling panels had an extremely high artistic value they were distinguished by a rich pattern and profiles in the form of frames and leaves uh, the consoles that support supported the ceiling were made in the form of human mask runes the carved ceiling panels of the castle are the only example of artistic carpentry that has come down to us in such a large sizes also and uh, about the name so every hall every room right uh, got uh, like it was named after something and it got their name from the color of the upholstery for example or just overall what was in the room so it was something like chinese room like golden room green room yellow room you know night room or for example in one of the halls there were a lot of venetian mirrors in gilded frames uh, that hung on the walls uh, uh, covered with Turkish fabrics and so this hall was called mirror hall and etc etc and almost all uh, rooms were decorated with collections of porcelain and crystal as well as some weapons and like a lot of weapons actually and according to the descriptions of the castle at the end of the 19th century there were about uh, 300 different paintings hundreds of them were just portraits and uh, like other 200 uh, or like more uh, like Diff on other different subjects. The portraits mainly depicted representatives of the families of the owners of the castle, so already named Konetspolsky, Sabeyski, Patoyski, Zhivutsky, and etc., and other related noble families of Ukraine and Poland. More than three quarters of the paintings were devoted to biblical subjects, among them the paintings of the outstanding Polish artist uh, Shimon Chekhovich, he worked here in 1762-1767. Uh, so the rest of the paintings belong to the battle genre and also represented a variety of mythological themes, landscape themes and etc. Then there were mostly, like these also were mostly actually copies of paintings by famous artists as Raphael, Stizian, Giuliano Romano, Giorgione, Rubens, Caravaggio and well, etc. And the collection of uh, paintings of the castle was one of the largest on the Ukrainian lands back then. But during the First World War, the castle was looted twice by the Russian army. They also destroyed the interior decoration. Well, basically everything as they're doing still now. Nothing changed. More than 100 years passed, but nothing changed. And I mean, like, not so... Uh, I will not be surprised if they have done this because they were bored. Because we can still see, you know, on, like, the occupied territories in some of the places uh, that... You know, they were firing, they were doing something, they were destroying stuff just for fun. You can literally see that, that it was just for fun because they were bored or something, I don't know. So, are we surprised? We are not. However, um, this was surprisingly not the worst scenario for the building because the castle was actually on the front line and was in danger of being actually just destroyed completely. So, um, you know, 
looted and everything better better this than completely destroyed and tear down to the ground uh, because uh, general Bursilov himself he made sure that the castle was preserved and no matter how uh, Pedirti castle was looted during the war what was left in it was enough for a private museum of the Sangushka to operate here in the interwar period still the family actually took great care uh, actually to evacuate most of the castle's collection so as i said they immigrated through europe into brazil so they were able to get this collect collection at least like some part of this collection right into san paulo into brazil uh, before the outbreak of World War II, so um, it is said uh, that some of this, if not all of the collection, actually now is in the museums in São Paulo in Brazil. So, but despite all of this, so I mean the fact that uh, San Rusko was able to take some part of the collection out and then that it was uh, stolen. Uh, we still have a number of canvases uh, from the Pedirti Castle now, uh, and well, now they are kept in the Lviv Historical Museum and the Lviv Art Gallery. Some of them are exhibited in the exposition of another castle, uh, which is called Olesko Castle, or in Ukrainian Oleski Zam. There is a lot of information about the insides, and we have a lot of photos, thanks God, like, and I mean like a lot. So I decided that, well, we will not get through every room, because it will take uh, way too much, many time, much time. And uh, yeah, so I just choose like three, four rooms that are, well, on my taste, maybe the most prominent or there is the most info about them. So let's get into that. And the first room that uh, I wanted to show you is the Knight's Hall, or it is called uh, also a dining room. So in the 18th century when this hall was decorated with a rich collection of weapons it was called the knights or uh, also was called arsenal this spacious and richly decorated hall was once considered one of the most important uh, like decorations I'm, I'm sorry for repeating myself of the palace its door portals were made of black marble as well, basically every other the hall had eight windows, while in other halls there were no more than three, actually. So again, we can see the importance of this room. In the hall there was a fireplace made of black marble, as well as two ancient stoves. Uh, the ceiling of the hall was decorated with an antique lampshade from the second half of the 17th century, with paintings of the same era on military themes, obviously. The walls of the hall were decorated with more than 70 paintings, like 70 portraits of prominent people and representatives of the families who owned the castle at different times, as well as other paintings, many of which were related to the battle theme, as I said already. But the highlight of the hall's uh, collection was not the portraits or the decor or of the wall and ceiling, but the rich collection of weapons located along the walls. Thanks to that, the hall, well, got its name. It was considered to be one of the best private weapons collection in, uh, well, back then in Rzeczpospolita. Its central place was occupied by about 40 complete sets of armor of winged hussars. Uh, so this is a thing, uh, well, if I'm not like, mistaken, but this is quite a unique thing for actually Poland, specifically in Europe. So they had this type of interesting and beautiful, beautiful armors. In addition, the hall was decorated with individual pieces of armor from different eras, so different helmets, uh, uh, like um, chain mails, shields, and etc. There was also a collection of bladed weapons and firearms. So bladed weapons, or I don't know whether you call it also in English, cold weapons, were represented by European swords, some sabers, spears, bikes, and etc. etc. Firearms were represented by shotguns and pistols. So the night hall served uh, to organize all kinds of celebrations and feasts for all the owners of the castle throughout all of this, this period of time. All important guests who came to the castle certainly visited the night's hall. The next room that I want to pay attention to is Crimson Hall and it got its name from the crimson damask fabric with uh, which the walls were decorated, so this like bright red color. For the same reason, the hall is sometimes called just Red Room or Red Hall. 
This room was often used as a living room, and as in other rooms, the walls here were decorated with portraits, paintings, among which were some copies of European paintings, as I mentioned, uh, as well as some originals also. It was so like one of the most beautiful halls of the palace. The floor of the hall was made of marble slabs of three colors, which created this beautiful mosaic pattern and effect. The huge ceiling was decorated with paintings on the theme of Roman mythology, and the ceiling was also supported by brackets decorated with heads carved from wood. Another impressive decoration of the hall were three Venetian glass chandeliers, and, uh, well, again, fireplaces. Uh, almost in every room there were these uh, uh, old uh, stoves, so here it was uh, no exception. And uh, there were a lot of different uh, furniture of Rococo style, which were very valuable. And well, it makes me very sad that we lost all of that. And uh, yeah, the doors uh, of this room uh, were leading to the adjacent green hall, where, uh, and they were covered with Turkish curtain. That was one of the valuable trophies of the Battle of Vienna. Another thing that I wanted to stop on it was uh, it is chapel well, was chapel because now when you are getting into the castle you are getting into the chapel actually but it's just white walls now with some old photos how the castle looked like well as you can see and uh, well it was uh, one of the main also like one of the most beautiful rooms as for me also you know looking at the old photos it looks looked amazing and the chapel was located in the central part of the castle in this tower basically and it was the highest room of the castle because the chapel stretched upward to a height of two floors it was crowned with a vaulted ceiling but probably at the beginning of the 19th century when the castle was in a catastrophic state the walls of the room collapsed However, later, under uh, Leon Zhivutsky, the vault was restored. The floor was originally paved with black and white marble slabs, but later, uh, probably after the marble was stolen, the floor was paved with simple stone slabs. Uh, the windows of the chapel overlooked the castle courtyard, and the main entrance to the chapel was once located opposite the altar from the side of the central staircase of the palace. Its walls were painted and decorated with different rent pilasters, stucco moldings, friezes, and other decor. There were many paintings and portraits on the walls, also, well, as you can see everywhere in, in the palace. And the altar of the chapel was made of black marble and decorated with gilding. To the right of the altar, there was a table made of black marble brought from Olesko Castle, and it is believed that this is the same table on which uh, Jan III Sabeski, so the king of Poland, was baptized. Opposite the altar, near the northern wall, we can see a uh, like this little balcony, a gallery, right? Under this gallery, in the walls, uh, two niches were built one of which was intended for prayers, the other was used for changing the priest's clothes before the service. We will not go further into the room, I just, uh, I think you understood already how beautiful this place was. I just want to tell you about, so, the second floor, so the floors above the, those that are, you know, these halls. And, uh, well, just briefly, because there were some interesting stuff there. So, for example, let's start with ballroom. So, at some point, like, the decoration here was completely destroyed because uh, in 19th century already there were some problems with the roof and thus well it affected the insides of the castle obviously and uh, yeah and as a result um, something like a storage facility for items from the castle collection uh, that were not of particular value was organized here the next for example also interesting is the uh, room about crimson hall so it it was said that here uh, Severin Zhivutsky, he had his chemical laboratory that was filled with a large number of different instruments, special vessels and similar items. Room about the Chinese cabinet, as I believe, it's like the most interesting because by the retellings of like, you know, according to the uh, local residents, there, wa there was once a large aquarium built into the ceiling of the hall. So it's, it's very interesting and I mean like I would really like to see that. And the walls of this room was decorated with a captured Turkish tent, which was considered the most beautiful in the castle collection overall. 
The room about the yellow hall was actually a private theater, so it was uh, founded around 1754 uh, by Vaclav Zhivutsky, and his theater here in Vidyirti was considered one of the best private stages in Europe. The theater in the castle operated successfully until 1767, when Vaclav was deported by order of the Russian authorities. After this, the room fell into despair, and, well, already mentioned uh, deplorable state of the castle's roof at the beginning of the 19th century led to the almost complete destruction of the decorative, uh, well, of decorations of just the world, the insides of this uh, room. The mosaic hall, like the room above the mosaic hall, there was another Turkish tent here, and on the tables and shelves there was a storage facility of all kinds of archaeological finds and fossils. However, the remain, remaining uh, rooms uh, of the upper floor were empty, as it said, in the 19th century, and they did not really like, particularly stand out. Uh, descriptions of the palace uh, from the late 19th and early 20th centuries noted that in these rooms there was nothing worthy of attention. Also, it is possible that some of the casemates uh, were also converted into some rooms, some halls, and here we have actually this photo, which, well, it is under the question mark, but it is believed that this is in one of the casemates, um, we don't know the year of the photo and everything, but uh, as you can see, this uh, Turkish tent, like beloved Turkish tents, uh, of the owners of these uh, castles. So throughout its centuries-old uh, history, the Pithirti castle has experienced many disasters, so some of them already mentioned, and it was destroyed during military operations and due to human indifference also, and it was reborn again and again and again. Well, now it also kind of, as we can say, reborn, but, well... <laughs> Uh, hoping for the best for the future and only before the beginning of our century the castle was uh, seriously rebuilt six times actually the castle was first damaged during the uprising of Bodan Khmelnytsky in 1648 so that was another hetman uh, of Ukraine and uh, again very important person in our history and uh, very controversial also as we can say so you know now uh, inside of the country actually we have such a discussion about Khmelnytsky and about the Mazepa whether they were heroes for Ukraine or we maybe they were the ones actually that destroyed everything for us so you know this is like our internal dis discussion also here but we will not get into this historic bit in this video so then you know, it had some damages again and again, but the major damages was all, were obviously done during First and Second World Wars. In October 1945, then the castle, uh, which um, at this period of time was already a branch of the Lviv Historical Museum, was looted by Soviet servicemen, as I already mentioned. Uh, they, the robbers stole paintings, a large amount of uh, high artistic value furniture, some chandeliers of the 17th century, number of uh, other antique items, and etc. Well, God knows why, but apparently they needed that. Uh, and then at the end of 1940s, the remaining exhibit were taken by Lviv museums, and the castle itself was handed over to the Ministry of Health of the Ukrainian SSR, which then turned this place into a sanatorium for tuberculosis. And in 1856 then, that's where we lost everything because there was a year where a fire broke out due to some negligence so the castle was almost completely burned down only the walls remained highly artistic ceilings all of this luxury luxurious parquet floors frescoes and all of the decor of the rich interior decoration of the halls perished in the flames so this is why we lost everything and well now it is almost impossible well let's be fair for ukraine it is impossible completely to renew this place so uh still they were able to uh, put the roof there and they uh, turned this place back into a sanatorium for tuberculosis and i was actually uh, to be honest i i don't know in in different like resources it was written that um this uh, tuberculosis sanatorium was functioning up actually to the like modern days to when we as a country became indep independent but I'm, I'm not sure about that uh, major restorations were completed in uh, early 1960s but uh, then we had some restorations done in 2017 also 
Uh, but all of this was done just grass to volunteers and, well, not the guard, this has already mentioned. The current state of the monument uh, creates a very <laughs> depressing impression, as you can see, and I mean, I'm more than sure that you will agree with me on that. Uh, all the buildings of the architectural ensemble, with the exception of the inn, are in an unsatisfactory and some even in an acute state of emergency. So the external conversion stairs are badly damaged. The atlas of the right pavilion actually is missing. Some of the balusters in many balustrades are knocked out. There is a significant deviation of the watchtower of the left northern bastion. The main portal of the castle, which completely collapsed in 1983, actually continues to still crumble. Trees began to grow on the stone uh, lining of the defensive di ditches, uh, which accelerates the destruction, and well, etc., etc., etc. I mean, again, it's kind of an atmospheric place, I'm not gonna lie, obviously, when this like half destroyed places have their own energy to that, but considering how rich this place is in history and everything, it's very sad to, uh, you know, to, to see this place just fade, fade away like that, and uh, at least, at least I think it's possible to uh, go around and trim the trees, I don't know, cut the grass or something like that, but the museum still makes it overgrown and everything. And again, I do understand that this is the question of funding and the fact that people are not being paid enough. So we museum workers, uh, we as if though I'm working in a museum. I mean, the museum workers overall, art historians are not having like very big salaries here in Ukraine, obviously, because as I said at the beginning of the video, that the art, the side the cultures part and uh, everything like that is something non-existent for our country unfortunately so this is everything that i have for you for today this overall information just for you to see um, again what we have in ukraine well unfortunately in such a state for certain reasons like internal external but yeah, but it is what it is. At least it is safe. At least it well, it stands as it is. So maybe one day, maybe one day, uh, it will be restored. But well, obviously with the war now going on, and more than obviously that years after, like I mean, this will have, uh, this will stop eventually. When? <laughs> That's another question. But it will stop eventually, and then, I think more years will pass before you know we will be able to do something there because i mean obviously financially it's completely impossible for the country to rebuild this uh, um this palace uh, in its uh, prior glory i do understand this because can you imagine how much money do you need to spend to bring like i mean you saw the interiors right you saw everything that was going on you saw how rich this place was and uh, just i mean if we will talk about to redo the plastering, you know, the floors and all of these like carvings, like it will cost like insane amount of money and we don't have them. And most probably we will not have them for the next decades. So yeah, but well, at least it is like that. At least it's it, it stands like that. But I mean, also as you, you saw, uh, some of the like some of my videos that uh, they are using actually this place as uh, art gallery sometimes so uh, they are doing some different like um, modern not like modern what is contemporary uh, contemporary exhibitions with contemporary artists and their works and well you saw a little bit of that I, I don't know who is that to be honest the works are horrendous but um, well <laughs> it is what it is i mean it, it's good that it is still used like that right at least like this and uh, and i mean it's actually interesting you know no matter how much i dislike contemporary art uh i really like the combinations uh i mean it's aesthetically pleasing when such an old place is being combined with something contemporary and even though there's this contemporary parts uh 
uh, looks horrendous but you know in combination with this older aesthetics it, it starts actually to look very nice and very good at, at least again aesthetically uh, but uh, yeah but yeah but i will show that uh, what oh my god what i have at the end of the day so something like this I, I know it looks like a medieval something but i mean it looks fine it looks fine in the head uh, my friend uh, she really likes you know stuff like that and and i mean she has this type of face that it really suits her so yeah so i've done something like that so it's like something like that the yarn is like amazingly beautiful so those of you who are knitting and really interested i really highly suggest like find this type of combination i mean i want i i, I think that i will I will knit myself a sweater also like that because it looks i mean on the sun like unfortunately we have a rain now but on the sun that looks like mwah, chef kiss so yeah so this is what we've done today we talked about Pedirti and the next video i am planning to do actually on a painter on a ukrainian painter because i mean for the past like videos we were more into this like uh decorative arts architecture you know some ancient art and everything i like it i mean Obviously, majoring in archaeology now. Uh, I really like it. I really like what I'm studying. This is, you know, my major, uh, my, like major. What is this? My main um, interest is in like these ancient periods of time and like early medieval, especially. But uh, sometimes you just want to sit and look at some paintings, and you know, my like art historian in me is crying a little bit, and she's like asking and begging, please let let let's talk about some paintings that analyze them a bit so never thought that i will um <laughs> really genuinely never thought that i will say this that i miss analyzing paintings <laughs> because that was such a horrendous part when i was on like bachelor in art history you know we needed to uh we were learning you know how to do like this uh, analysis of like paintings of sculpture because you know you need to pay attention to some like different stuffs there now, you cannot analyze painting and sculpture by the same shim uh so yeah but well eventually i came to the point where i'm like i really want to look into something i really want to talk about some kind of paintings and just how i feel about them uh so yeah so the next video will be about one of the ukrainian painters okay <laughs> i'm stopping here that's all for today i uh, hope it was interesting for you i hope you find something new and it was definitely fun because I'm more than sure that you never heard about Pidirci Castle. Uh, Christmas already passed, but I still hope that you had a happy Christmas and, uh, well, in advance, a uh, happy new year. Stay safe, keep yourself warm. I don't know, because there's also a lot of illnesses going on now. This is, again, the season of illnesses. And uh, yeah, so stay safe and I hope to see you in the next videos. Bye-bye.